Good evening and welcome to Tinkering with Ed Kellar. Last time I started working on a Precision Instruments ES500 scope. It was in dire need of restoration, so let's see where I can take it from here. The large selection switch, used to select the horizontal deflection, is easy to disassemble and clean. The other two selection switches, for the sync source and attenuation, are riveted. I had to be very careful not to break the base plate when I removed it, but at the amount of yuck in there, it was well worth it. I did a few random checks on the resistors and found about 50% of them to be out of their 10% tolerance, 10% of which out by over 100% even. Or to put it another way, I have no reason to trust any of the resistors either. The general state of the chassis was also far from acceptable rust spots and rather nasty patina all over. Add that to the wonky resistors and outright filthy wiring loom, I think it's time for drastic measures. Decision number one. Strip down the chassis completely so I can get some serious sanding and polishing done. Decision number two. Get rid of that sad excuse for wiring. I'm sure whatever I can put in there is slightly less sad.
originally I tried to keep at least the tube sockets in place, but some of them had a bit of rust growing around them, so better go for the last mile. Now would be a good time to reflect on life choices. Or at least get that case fixed up. There was some rust checking going on and the paint was missing in parts. I tried some scraping and rust remover first, but this called for the big guns. A quick coat of rust proving primer followed by a layer of black paint and another one of black structure paint later, I can put on the new handle. Well, it's a bit too long. Maybe I can find a shorter one eventually, but for now, this is good. The original holding brackets took the nickel plating quite well and look all spiffy again. The big canned electrolytics get gutted again, not that much of this cope will remain original by now, but I still think the thought counts. Since this time the bottom cover plates did not survive, I made sockets in OpenSCAD, so I can put in the new caps on top and have the leads on the bottom as mounting points.
the original binding posts were missing two of the screws, so I started up the lathe again. The most difficult part was to find the die in the right size. Something something TPI? Certainly not metric. I did the sequence of operations based on the forces involved. Knurling first, then thread cutting. Those will almost certainly break weaker parts. The center hole, a 4mm banana compatible one, is next. Then chamfer and part off. Countersink the outside hole and repeat. The fuse holder has one leg loose. That causes a bad connection and possible issues, so I tried to replace the rivet, but ended up using a small nut and screw instead. Let's talk about spare parts next. I found all the required capacitors with close enough values. The resistors were a bit more complicated. Some had unusual values and quite a few were expected to dissipate more than 2 watts. I found some carbon resistor packs that included close enough values, but for the quality it might also be only close enough. For the higher voltage caps I found used microwave capacitors. They come with built-in bleed resistors, but that shouldn't change much overall. For wires I found a nice high voltage line and a few colors of clothed wires for some authentic look. I checked the current rating and it should work out even for the heater circuits. Now, time to throw everything back together, I guess. Let's start with the chassis and front panel. The plan of attack is as follows. Complete the build one section after the other and test each one independently. That way any errors or faults show up early and should be easy to find and fix. 
I start with the power supply. Annoying, cause now I have to haul the transformer around every time I move that thing. Input calls for two caps against ground. I use properly Y rated ones, but I can't help to keep my usual corded lamp power cord. It fits to the other restorations. With the primary connected through the power switch, it is time to validate the transformer again. It's been half a year since I rewound it, so I needed a refresher on the pinout. Up next, the high voltage rectifier tube. The first one with a cap anode I actually have in circuit. The cathode and heater connection is directly linked to the high voltage output inside the transformer. The supply of the high voltage section is running through a set of resistors to derive the proper voltages, including the intensity and focus potentiometers, so I have to route the lines back and forth quite a bit. Before I can hook up the tube and see anything, I need to set up the B plus line too. Main rectifier tube, choke, filter caps and resistor ladder for the centering potentiometers. But here we need to talk about the two different schematics. 
I discovered two changes in the revision, let's look at them. Change number one. The centering voltage divider is slightly different. The new design limits the range that can be applied by adding a resistor on top and reducing the bottom one. So the center position should be more centered. Change number two. The vertical driver tube was changed. Originally both drivers were 7W7s, now the vertical one is a 7AD7, which seemed to have changed some of the support components around it as well. Now I assume that these changes were made to improve the design of the scope, and since I found a good 7AD7 tube, I will go with the newer revision for my rebuild. And this is just about enough for another episode. It is getting there. Tune in next time for the conclusion. Since these types are hard to come by these days, I was a bit of hesi I was a bit of hesitant.